Hello everyone, you watching Let's Talk About Prepping. I'm Tyler, your host, and in this video we're going to continue our reading of the book Lucifer's Hammer by Larry Niven and Jerry Purnell. This is a very good book about a comet striking Earth and the aftermath that the survivors have to deal with. I strongly suggest that you guys get a copy for yourself, as this is just a really good bit of survivalist fiction. Anyways, today we'll continue our reading of Chapter 1 and Subchapter February 1. On the other hand, it is necessary to shape the social structure of the worker's world in such a way as to take away his fear of being a mere cog in an impersonal machine. A true solution can come only through the conception that work, whatever it must be, is the service of God and of the community, and therefore the expression of man's dignity. Emil Brunner, Gifford Lectures, 1948 Westwood Boulevard was not even remotely on the way between the offices of the National Broadcasting System and the Randall home near Beverly Glen, which was the main reason Harvey Randall liked the bars there. He wasn't likely to run into any of the network officials, and he wasn't likely to find any of Loretta's friends. Students wandered along the wide street. They came in assortments, bearded and wearing jeans, clean-cut with expensive jeans, deliberately weird and young fogey conservative, and everything in between. Harvey strolled with them. He passed specialty bookstores. One was devoted to gay lib, another called itself the Macho Adult Bookstore and meant it, and another catered to the science fiction crowd. Harvey made a mental note to go in there. They'd probably have a lot of stuff about comets and astronomy geared to a general readership. After he read that, he could go to the UCLA campus store and get the really technical material. Past the sisterhood place was a plate glass window. Letters and gothic script said, Security First Federal Bar. Inside were stools, three small tables, four booths, a pinball machine, and a jukebox. The walls were decorated with whatever the customers preferred. A supply of marking pens lay on the bar, and the walls were whitewashed at intervals. Paint peeled away in places to reveal comments made years before, a kind of pop culture archaeology. Harvey moved into the dimness like a tired old man. As his eyes adjusted, he spotted Mark Chesky on a stool. He pulled himself up next to Chesky and propped elbows on bar. Chesky was thirty-odd, almost ageless, a perpetual young man about to launch himself on his career. Harvey knew Mark had been in the Navy for four years and had tried several colleges, starting at UCLA and working down through community junior colleges. He sometimes called himself a student even yet, but no one believed he'd ever finish. He wore biker's boots, old jeans, a t-shirt, and a crumpled Aussie digger hat. He wore his black hair long and his black beard full. There was ground-in dirt under his nails and fresh streaks of grease on the jeans, but his hands and clothes had been freshly washed for all of that. He just didn't have any pathological need to be scrubbed pink. When Mark wasn't smiling, he had a dangerous look, despite the respectable beer belly. He smiled a lot, but he could take some things very seriously, and he sometimes moved with a tough crowd. They were part of his image. Mark Chesky could run with the real bikers if he wanted to, but he didn't want to. Just now, he looked concerned. You don't look good, he said. I feel like killing somebody, said Harvey. You feel that way? I could maybe find somebody, Mark said. He let it trail off. No, they're my bosses. They're all of them my bosses. Damn their innumerable souls. Harvey ordered a pitcher and two glasses and ignored Mark's suggestion. He knew Mark couldn't arrange a real murder. It was part of the Chesky image, to know more than you did about whatever subject came up. It usually amused Harvey, but just now he wasn't in the mood for games. I want something from them, Harvey said, and they know they're going to give it to me. How the hell can they not know? I've even got the sponsor wired. But the sons of bitches have to play games. If one of them fell off a balcony tomorrow, I'd be in for an extra month breaking in a new one, and I can't afford the time. It didn't hurt to humor Chesky. The guy could be useful and a lot of fun, and maybe he could arrange a murder. 
You never really knew. So what are they going to give you? Mark asked. A comet. I'm going to make a whole series of documentaries about a new comet. The guy who discovered it chances to own 70% of the company that would sponsor the documentaries. Chesky chortled. Harvey nodded the agreement. It's a beautiful setup. Chance to make the kind of films I really want to do. And to learn a lot. Not like that last shit, interviewing doomsters, everybody with his own private vision of the end of the world. I wanted to cut my throat and get it over with before that one was finished. So what's wrong? Harvey sighed and drank more beer and said, Look, there are about four guys who could really tell me to go take a flying frig and make it stick. But that'd be a mistake, right? The New York people won't put up with blowing a sponsored series. They're going to buy the show, but how will anyone know they've got the power to say no if they don't hesitate and demand I write up treatments and do budget estimates and all that crap? None of that shit gets used, but they've got to have a sound basis for decisions. Four fucking prima donnas who actually have the power. Okay, I could live with them, but then there are a couple of dozen who couldn't stop a Time for Beanie revival, but they want to show how important they are, too. So, to show each other they could really stop the show if they wanted to, they raise as many objections as they can. Got the best interest for the sponsors. Got the interests of the sponsors in mind, right? Don't want to get Calva so mad, right? Bullshit. But I've got to put up with it. Harvey was suddenly aware of what he sounded like. Look, let's change the subject. Right. You've noticed the name of this place. Security First Federal Bar. Cube. Stolen from George Carlin. About time, too. Right. Now, maybe some others will pick up on the idea. Can you see Crazy Eddie's insurance? Why not? They bought cars from Madman Munts. How about Fat Jack's Cancer Clinic? Fat Jack's Cancer Clinic and Mortuary, Chesky said. The tightness in Harvey's neck and shoulders was going away. He drank more beer than went to a booth where he could lean against something. Mark followed and took the opposite seat. Hey, Harv, when are we making another run? Your bike still work? Yeah. A year ago. No, damn it. Two years and more. He'd said to hell with it and let Mark Chesky lead him on a ride up the coast, drinking in little bars, talking to other drifters, camping where they felt like it. Chesky took care of the bikes, and Harvey paid the bills, not that they amounted to much. It had been a time of no worries. The bike works, but I won't get a chance to use it. When this series gets going, it'll take full time. Anything I can get in on? Mark asked. Harvey shrugged. Why not? Mark often worked on Harvey's shows. He carried cameras or clipboards and did maintenance or just plain acted as a gopher. If you'll shut up once in a while. I'm hip. The bar was filling up. The jukebox ran out of sound, and Mark got up. Something just for you, he said. He retrieved his 12-string guitar from behind the bar and took a chair at the end of the room. This, too, was part of his routine. Chesky sang for drinks and meals and bars. On the run up the coast, Mark had got them free steaks in half the places between L.A. and Carmel. He was good enough to be professional, but he wouldn't discipline himself. Whenever he got a regular gig, it didn't last a week. To Mark, those who made steady money were magicians with a secret that he couldn't quite learn. Mark strummed an experimental chord, then began a prologue. The tune was the old cowboy number, Cool Clear Water. All day I face the TV waste without a trace of culture. Pure culture. With soapbox operas all day long and giveaway shows that run too long and lead you on from culture. Pure, sweet culture. Harvey laughed approval. A fat man at the bar sent over a pitcher of beer and Mark acknowledged with a toss of his head. The sun goes down and through the town you hear the cry for culture. Sweet culture. While lawyers grin and cops will win to stop the sin of culture. Culture your culture. There was a short break as Mark picked at the guitar. 
The chords jangled, obviously wrong, but obviously right, too, as if Mark were searching for something he could never find. Keep a tune in, friend, it'll set you in a trend, and your mind is going to bend, and hook you in the end with culture, culture, pure culture. Friend, can't you see, for you and me, and a mind that's free, it's pay TV for you and me, and culture, culture, pure, sweet, culture. The guitar stopped and Mark said in a plonking voice, Almost as much as you get from an old Boggart movie. Pure, sweet, culture. Leonard Bernstein conducts the London Symphony Orchestra and the Rolling Stones in a dazzling display of culture. Pure, sweet, culture. Folks, tonight we have a debate between the President of the United Farm Workers versus 22 hunger-maddened housewives armed with butcher knives. It's culture. P-U-R-E-S-W-E-E-T-C-U-L-T-U-R-E. Jesus, thought Harvey. Jesus, I'd like to play a recording of that in a goddamn executive council meeting at the network. Harvey leaned back to enjoy his moment. It wouldn't be long before he had to go home to dinner and Loretta and Andy and Kipling, and the home he loved but whose price was just so damned high. The Santa Ana still blew, hot and dry across the Los Angeles basin. Harvey drove with open windows, his coat thrown onto the seat beside him, tie atop the pile. Headlights picked up green hillsides among bare trees, palm trees at intervals. He drove in the full summery darkness of a California February, and he noticed nothing unusual about it. He hummed Mark's song as he drove. One day, he thought, one day I'll slip a tape of that onto the music system so three quarters of the business people in Los Angeles and Beverly Hills will have to listen to it. Half concentrating, he daydreamed in fragments that shattered when some car head slowed and the flare of brake lights surged like a wave. At the top of the hill, he turned right onto Mulholland, right again onto Benedict Canyon, downhill slightly, then right onto Fox. Fox Lane was one of a cluster of short, curved streets lined with 15-year-old houses. One of them belonged to Harvey, courtesy of Pasadena Savings and Loan. Further down Benedict Canyon was the turn onto Cielo Drive, where Charlie Manson had proved to the world that civilization was neither eternal nor safe. After that Sunday morning of horror in 1969, there was not a gun or a guard dog to be had in Beverly Hills. Back orders for shotguns stretched delivery time to weeks. And ever since, despite Harvey's pistol and shotgun and dog, Loretta wanted to move. She was searching for safety. Home. A big white house with green roof, trim front lawn, a big tree, and small porch. It had a good resale value because it was the least expensive house on the block, but least expensive is a relative thing, as Harvey well knew. His house had a conventional driveway, not a big circular entry like the house across the street. He took the corner at a good clip, slowed in the drive, and zapped the garage door with the radio beam widget. The door swung up before he could reach it, perfect timing, and Harvey scored a mental point with himself. The garage door closed behind him, and he sat for a moment in darkness. Harvey didn't like driving in rush hours, and he drove the rush hour twice nearly every day of his life. Time for a shower, he thought. He got out of the car and walked back down the drive toward the kitchen door. Hey, Harv, the baritone voice bellowed. Yo, Harvey answered. Gordy Vance, Randall's neighbor on the left, was coming across his lawn with a rig trailing behind him. He leaned on the fence, and Harvey did the same, thinking as he did of cartoons of housewives chatting this way. Only, Loretta didn't like Mary Vance, and would never be seen leaning on a back fence, anyway. So, Gordy, how are things at the bank? Gordy's smile wavered. They'll keep. Anyway, you're not ready for electron inflation. Listen, can you get away on the weekend? Thought we'd take the scouts up for a snow hike. Boy, that sounds good. Clean snow. It was hard to believe that no more than an hour away, 
in the Angeles Forest Mountains was deep snow and wild whistling wind in the evergreens while they stood here in their shirt sleeves in the dark. Probably not, Gordine. There's a job coming up. Christ, I hope there's a job coming up. You better not count on me. What about Andy? Thought I'd use him as patrol leader this trip. He's a little young for that. Not really, and he's got experience. I'm taking some new kids on a first hike. Could use Andy. Sure, he's up on his schoolwork. Where are you going? Cloudburst Summit. Harvey laughed. Tim Hamner's observatory wasn't far from there, although Harvey had never seen it. He must have hiked past it a dozen times. They discussed details. With the Santa Ana blowing, there'd be melt-off on all but the top elevations, but there would certainly be snow on the north slopes. A dozen scouts and Gordy. It sounded like fun. It was fun. Harvey shook his head ruefully. You know, Gordo, when I was a kid, it was a good week's hike to Cloudburst. No road. Now, we drive it in an hour. Progress. Yeah, but it is progress, isn't it? I mean, now we can get there and still keep a job. Sure. Damn, I wish I could go. By the time they'd driven up an hour and hiked in and got the gear out of their backpacks and set up camp and got damp wood burning and their backpack stoves going, the freeze-dried mountain food always tasted like ambrosia. And coffee at midnight, standing in a shelter out of the wind and listening to it whistle above. But it wasn't worth a comment. Sorry. Right. Okay, I'll check with Andy. Go over his gear for me, will you? Sure. What Gordy meant was, don't let Loretta pack for your son. It's hard enough hiking at that altitude without all the crap she'd make him carry. Hot water bottles, extra blankets, once even an alarm clock. Harvey had to go back for his jacket and tie. When he came out of the garage, he went another way, into the backyard. He'd thought of asking Gordy, how do you feel about calling it Gordo's Bank and Cafe Clash? From the look on Gordy's face when the bank was mentioned, it wouldn't go over. Some kind of trouble there. Private trouble. Andy was in the backyard, across the pool, playing basketball solitaire. Randall stood quietly watching him. In zero time, in what must have been a year but felt like a week, Andy had changed from a boy into a, into a stick figure. All arms and legs and hands, long bones, poised behind a basketball. He launched it with exquisite care danced to catch the rebound, dribbled, and fired again for a perfect score. Andy didn't smile. He nodded in somber satisfaction. Kid's not bad, Harvey thought. His pants were new, but they didn't reach his ankles. He'd be 15 next September, ready for high school, and there was nothing for it but to send him to Harvard School for Boys, certainly the best in Los Angeles. Only, the school wanted a fortune just to hold a place, and the orthodontist wanted thousands now and more later. And there was the funny noise from the pool pump and the electronics club Andy was involved in. It wouldn't be long before the boy wanted a microcomputer for himself, and who could blame him? And Randall went inside, quietly, glad that Andy hadn't noticed him. A teenage boy used to be an asset. He could work in the fields, drive a team, or even a tractor. The pressure could be shared, shifted to younger shoulders. A man could ease off. There was wrapping paper in the kitchen wastebasket. Loretta had been shopping again. Christmas had been on charge accounts, and those bills would be coming to roost on his desk. He'd already heard the stock market report on the radio. The market was down. Loretta was nowhere around. Harvey went into the big dressing room off the bathroom and stripped got into the shower. Hot water beat down on his neck, draining away tension. His mind was turned off. He imagined himself as meat being massaged by hydraulic pressure. Only, if only his mind would really turn off. Andy has a conscience. God knows I never tried to make him feel guilty. Discipline, sure. Punishment, standing in a corner, even a formal spanking, but when it's over, it's over. No lingering guilt. But he knows guilt anyway. If Andy knew what he's costing me in dollars and cents, and in the years of my life, if he ever knew what it does to the way I have to live, 
the shit I put up with to keep that goddamn job and win the bonuses that keep us afloat. What would Andy do if he knew? Run away? Get a job at a street sweeper in San Francisco to try to pay me back? He damned well is not going to know. A voice in the roar of water. Huh? Randall came out of the internal world and found Loretta smiling through the glass shower door. She mouthed, Hi, how'd it go? He waved. Loretta took it as an invitation. Randall watched her undress slowly, lasciviously, and slide through the glass door quick so the water wouldn't splash out. And it wasn't Wednesday. Harvey folded her in his arms. The water beat down on them and they kissed. And it wasn't Wednesday. She asked, how'd it go? He had read her lips the first time, but she couldn't guess that. Now he had to answer. I think they'll do it. I don't see why not. It doesn't make sense. If they wait, CBS will take it. Right. The magic went out of the shower orgy scene. Poof. Isn't there any way to tell them how silly they're being? No. Harvey fiddled with the shower head. The water expanded to a fine spray. Why not? Because they know. Because they're not playing the same game we are. It all depends on you. If you insist on doing it your way, just once... Loretta's hair darkened and dampened under the shower. She held him in her arms and looked up into his face, looking for the strengthening of purpose that would mean she'd convinced him that he would stand by his principles and force his superiors to face the consequences of their mistakes. Yeah, it all depends on me. Which makes me the obvious target if anything goes wrong. Turn around and I'll do your back. She turned her back. Harvey reached for the soap. His will loosed its hold on the muscles of his face. His soapy hands made patterns in the slippery contours of Loretta's back. Slowly, every move a caress. But he was thinking, don't you know what they'd do to me? They'd never fire me, but one day my office is an inside broom closet. The next day the rug is gone. Then my phone doesn't work. By the time I quit, everyone in the industry has forgotten I exist, and we're still spending every cent I make. He had always loved Loretta's back. He searched his mind for growing lust, but he felt nothing. She was in on this from the beginning. It's her life, too. Not fair to lock her out. But she just won't understand. I can get Mark off a subject. He'll drink my beer and talk about something else if I make it plain enough, but I can't talk to Loretta like that. What I need is a drink. Loretta washed his back for him, and then they dried each other with the big towels. She was still trying to tell him how to handle the situation at the studio. She knew something was wrong, and as usual, she probed at it, trying to understand, trying to help. Myriads of orbits later, when true humans were spreading through a world Held fast in the grip of an ice age, the black planet came again. The comet was larger now. It had grown snowflake by isolated snowflake over a thousand million years, until it was four and a half miles across. But now its surface warmed in a bath of infrared heat. Within the comet's tissues, pockets of hydrogen and helium vaporized and seeped through the crust. The tiny sun was eclipsed. The ringed black disk covered a third of the sky, leaking the heat of its birth. Then it had passed, and calm returned. The comet had healed from a previous pass. Centuries, millennia, what are they in the cometary halo? The time had come at last to this comet. The black giant's passing had stopped it cold in its orbit. Slowly, urged by the faint tugging of the sun's gravity, it began to drop toward the maelstrom. <clears throat> February 2. It appears that the inner planets have ceaselessly been bombarded since their formation. Mars, Mercury, and Earth's moon have undergone repeated strikes by objects ranging in size, from micrometeorites to whatever cracked the moon and created the large lava basin called Oceanus Procellarum. Although it was originally thought that Mars, because it was at the edge of the asteroid belt, experienced a higher rate of meteoric bombardment, 
Examination of Mercury indicates that Mars is not exceptional, and the inner planets have approximately equal probabilities of being struck. Mariner Preliminary Report The travel hall was crammed with equipment. Cameras, tape recorders, lights and reflectors, battery belts, the myriad paraphernalia of the roving TV interview. Charlie Bascom, cameraman, was in the back with the sound man, Manuel Arguelles. Everything normal, except that Mark Chesky was in the front seat when Harvey came out of the NBS offices. Harvey beckoned to Mark. They walked across the studio lot toward Mercedes Row, where the executives parked. Look, Harvey said, your job title is production assistant. That theoretically makes you management. It has to be that way because of union rules. Yeah, Mark said, but you aren't management. You're a gopher. I'm hip. Mark sounded hurt. Don't get upset and don't get huffy. Just understand. My crew has been with me a long time. They know the game. You don't. I know that too. Fine. You can be a big help. Just remember, what we don't need is, is me telling everybody how to do their job. He flashed a big grin. I like working for you. I won't blow it. Good. Harvey detected no signs of irony in Mark's voice. It made him feel better. He had been worried about this interview. It had to be said, but that didn't make it easier. One of his associates had once remarked that Mark was like a jungle. All right, but you had to chop him back every now and then, or he'd grow all over you. The travel all started instantly. It had been through a lot with Harvey Randall, from the Alaskan pipeline to the lower tip of Baja, even into Central America. They were old friends, the travel all, and Harvey. A big three-seat international harvester, four-wheel drive, truck motor, ugly as sin, and utterly reliable. He drove in silence to the Ventura freeway and turned toward Pasadena. Traffic was light. You know, Harvey said, we're always complaining how nothing works, but here we are going 50 miles for this interview, and we count on being there in less than an hour. When I was a kid, a 50-mile trip was something you packed lunches for and hoped you'd make it by dark. What did you have, a horse? Charlie asked. Nope, just L.A., without the freeways. Yuck. They drove through Glendale and turned north on Linda Vista to go past the Rose Bowl. Charlie and Manuel talked about bets they'd lost a few weeks before. I thought Caltech owned JPL, Charlie said. They do, Mark told him. Sure put it way the hell far from Pasadena. Used to test jet engines there, Mark said. JPL, Jet Proportion Laboratories, right? Everybody thought they'd blow up, so they made Caltech put the labs out in the Arroyo. He waved to indicate the house was outside. Then, they built the most expensive suburb in this end of L.A. just around it. The guard was expecting them. He waved them into a lot near one of the large buildings. JPL nestled into its arroyo and filled it with office buildings. A big central steel and glass tower looked strangely out of place among the older Air Force standard temporary structures erected 20 years before. There was a PR flak waiting for them. She led them through the routine, sign in, wear badges. Inside, it looked like any other office building, but not quite. There were stacks of IBM cards in the corridors, and almost no one wore coats or ties. They passed a 10-foot color globe of Mars gathering dust in a corner. No one paid any attention to Harvey and his people. It wasn't unusual to see TV crews. JPL had built the Pioneer and Mariner space probes, had set Viking down on Mars. Here we are, the PR flag said. The office looked good. Books on the wall, incomprehensible equations on the blackboards, books on every flat surface in view, IBM printouts all over the expensive teak desk. Dr. Sharps, Harvey Randall, the flag said. She hovered near the door. Charles Sharps wore glasses that curved around to cover his whole field of view, very modernistic, vaguely insectile against his long, pale face. His hair was black and straight, worn short. His fingers played with a felt-tip pen, or fished into his pockets, always moving. He looked to be about 30, but might have been older, and he wore a sport jacket and tie. Now let's get this straight, Sharps said. You want a lecture on comets. 
for yourself or for the public? Both. Simple for the camera, as much as I can understand, for me. If it's not too much trouble. Too much trouble, Sharps laughed. How could it be too much trouble? Your network tells NASA you want to do a documentary on space, and NASA sends up red rockets. Right, Charlene? The PR flag nodded. They asked us to cooperate. Cooperate, Sharps laughed again. I'd jump through hoops if I thought it would help get a budget. When do we start? Now, please, Harvey said. The crew will set up while we chat. Just ignore them. I take it you're the resident expert on comets. I suppose so, Sharp said. Actually, I like asteroids, but somebody has to study comets. I gather you're interested mainly in Hamner Brown. Right. Charlie caught Harvey's eye. They were ready. Harvey gave them the nod. Manuel listened and watched the indicator and said, Speed. Mark stepped in front of the camera. Sharp's interview. Take one. The chalkboard came together with a loud clack. The Sharps jumped. They always did the first time. Charlie busied himself with the camera. He kept it aimed at Sharps. They'd film Harvey asking the questions later when Sharps wasn't around. Tell me, Dr. Sharps, will Hamner Brown be visible to the naked eye? Don't know, Sharps said. He sketched something unlikely on the IBM printout in front of him. The sketch might have been of a pair of mating Loch Ness monsters. A month from now, we'll know much better. We already know it's going to get as close to the sun as Venus, but... He broke off and looked at the camera. What level do you want this at? Anything you like, Harvey said. Make me understand, then we can decide how to tell the public. Sharps shrugged. All right. So there's a solar system out there. He waved toward one wall. A big chart of the planets and their orbits hung next to the chalkboard. Planets and moons always where they should be. They do a great complicated dance around each other. Every planet, every moon, every little rock in the asteroid belt, all dancing to Newton's song of gravity. Mercury got a little out of step and we had to revise the universe to make it fit. How's that? Harvey asked. And I'd have preferred to do the poetry myself, but what the hell. Mercury. Orbit changes just a little every year. Not much, but more than Newton says it should. So a man named Einstein found a good explanation, and incidentally managed to make the universe a stranger place than it was before. Oh, I hope we don't need relativity to understand comets. No, no, but there's more than gravity to a comet's orbit. That's surprising, isn't it? Yes, are we going to have to revise the universe again? What? No, it's simpler than that. Look. Sharps jumped to his feet and was at the blackboard. He looked for chalk and muttered. Here you go. Mark took chalk from his pocket and handed it over. Thanks. Sharps sketched a white blob, then a parabolic curve. That's the comet. Now, let's put in planets. He drew two circles. Earth and Venus. I thought planets moved in elliptical orbits, Harvey said. So they do, but on any scale you could draw, you can't see the difference. Now, look at the comet's orbit. Both arms of the curve look just the same, coming in and going out. Textbook parabola, right? Right. But here's what the comet really looks like when it falls away from the sun. A dense nucleus, a coma of fine dust and gas. He was drawing again. And a plume of dusty gas streaming away from the sun, ahead of the comet going out. The tail. A big tail. A hundred million miles long sometimes. But it's nearly a vacuum. It has to be. If it were thick, there wouldn't be enough matter in the comet to fill that much space. Sure. Okay, and again, like the textbooks. Material boils out of the head of the comet into the coma. It's a thin gas, tiny particles, so tiny that sunlight can push them around. Light pressure from the sun makes them stream away, so the tail always faces away from the sun. Okay? Tail follows the comet going in, leaves it coming out. But the stuff boils out unevenly. When the comet first falls into the system, it's a solid mass, we think. Nobody really knows. We have several models that fit the observations. Me, I like the dirty snowball model. The comet's made of rocks and dust, the dirt, balled up with ices and frozen gases. 
some water ice, methane, carbon dioxide, dry ice, cyanogen, and nitrogen, all kinds of stuff. Pockets of these gases thaw and blast out to one side or the other, like jet propulsion, and it changes the orbit. Sharps was at work with the chalk, holding it sideways. When he finished, the incoming arm had jogs and jiggle in it, and the outgoing arm was blurred into a wide sweep not unlike the comet's tail. So we don't know how close to Earth it's coming. I see, and you don't know how big the tail will be. Right, but this seems to be a new comet. Maybe it's never made the trip down close to the sun before. Not like Halley's Comet, which comes around every 70 years and gets smaller each time. Comets die a little every time they pass near the sun. They lose all that tail material forever. So each time the tail's smaller, until eventually there's nothing left but the nucleus, and that comes as a handful of rocks, meteor showers. Some of our best shooting stars are pieces of old comets falling onto Earth. But this one's new. That's right. So it ought to have a spectacular tail. I seem to remember people said that about Kahootek. And I seem to remember they were wrong. Wasn't there an outfit selling commemorative medals that would show Kahootek exactly as it appeared? You see, there's no way to know. But my guess is that Hamner Brown will be quite a sight, and it ought to pass fairly close to Earth. Sharps drew a dot within the blur of the comet's outgoing course. That's where we'll be. Of course, we won't see a lot until the comet passes the Earth, because until it gets by, we'll be looking straight into the sun to see it. Hard to observe then. But when it's past us, it should be quite a sight. There have been comets with tails across half the sky, see them in daytime. We're overdue for a big comet this century. Hey doc, Mark said, you've got Earth right in that thing's path. Could it hit us? Harvey turned to look daggers at Mark. Sharps was laughing. Chances are zillions to one against it. You see the Earth as a dot on the blackboard. Actually, if I drew this to scale, you wouldn't be able to see the Earth in the drawing, or the comet nucleus either. So what's the chance that a couple of pinpoints will come together? He frowned at the board. Of course, the tail is likely to go where we do. We might be in it for weeks. What does that do? Harvey asked. We went through the tail of Haley's Comet, Mark said. Didn't hurt a thing. Pretty lights, and... This time, Harvey's look was enough. Your friend's right, Sharps said. I knew that. Dr. Sharps... Why do all the astronomers get so excited about Hamner Brown? Harvey asked. Man, we can learn a lot from comets. Things like the origins of the solar system. They're older than Earth, made out of primordial matter. This comet may have been out there way past Pluto for billions of years. Present theory says the solar system condensed from a cloud of dust and gas, an eddy in the interstellar medium. Most of that blew away when the sun started to burn, but some is still in the comet. We can analyze the tail, the way we did with Kutek. Kutek was no disappointment to astronomers. We used tools we'd never had before. Skylab, lots of things. And that was useful, Harvey prompted. Useful? It was magnificent. We should do it again. Sharps' hands waved around in dramatic gestures. Harvey glanced quickly at his crew. The camera was rolling, and Manuel had that contented look a sound man has when things are going well in his phones. Could we get something like Skylab up there in time? Harvey asked. Skylab? No. But Rockwell's got an Apollo capsule we could use, and we've got the equipment here at the labs. There are big military boosters around, things the Pentagon doesn't need anymore. We could do it if we started now, and we weren't chicken about it. Sharps' face fell. But we won't. Too damn bad, too. We could really learn something from Hamner Brown that way. The cameras and sound equipment were packed away, and the crew went out with the PR lady. Harvey was saying his farewells to Sharps. Want some coffee, Harvey? You're in no hurry, are you? Sharps asked. Guess not. Sharps punched a button on the phone console. Larry, get us some coffee, please. He turned back to Harvey. Damnedest thing, he said. Whole nation depends on technology. Stop the wheels for two days and you'd have riots. 
no place is more than two meals from a revolution. Think of Los Angeles or New York with no electricity. Or a longer view, fertilizer plants stop. Or a longer view yet, no new technology for 10 years. What happens to our standard of living? Sure, we're a high technology civiliz- Yet, Sharp said. His voice was firm. He intended to finish. Yet the damned fools won't pay 10 minutes attention a day to science and technology. How many people know what they're doing? Where do these carpets come from? The clothes you're wearing? What do carburetors do? Where do sesame seeds come from? Do you know? Does one voter out of 30? They won't spend 10 minutes a day thinking about the technology that keeps them alive. No wonder the research budget has been cut to nothing. We'll pay for that. One day we'll need something that could have been developed years before but wasn't. He stopped himself. Tell me, Harv, will this TV thing of yours be big or will it get usual billing for a science program? Prime time, Harvey said. A series on the value of Hamner Brown and, incidentally, on the value of science. Of course, I can't guarantee people won't turn to reruns of I Love Lucy. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Larry. Put the coffee right there. Harvey had expected styrofoam cups and machine coffee. Instead, Sharps' assistant brought in a gleaming thermos pitcher, silver spoons, and sugar and cream service on an inlaid teak tray. Help yourself, Harvey. It's good coffee. Mocha java? Right, the assistant said. Good. He waved dismissal. Harv, why this sudden change of heart by the networks? Harvey shrugged. Sponsor insists on it. The sponsor happens to be Calva Soap, which happens to be controlled by Timothy Hamner, who happens. Harvey was cut off by shrieks of laughter. Sharps' thin face contorted in glee. Beautiful. Then he looked thoughtful. A series. Tell me, Harv, if a politician helped us with the study, helped a lot, could he be worked into the series? Get some favorable publicity? Sure. Hamner would insist on it. Not that I'd object. Marvelous. Sharps lifted his coffee cup. Cheers. Thanks, Harv. Thanks a lot. I think we'll be seeing more of each other. Sharps waited until Harvey Randall had left the building. He sat very still, something unusual for him, and he felt excitement in the pit of his stomach. It might work. It just might. Finally, he punched the intercom. Larry, get me Senator Arthur Jellison in Washington. Thanks. Then he waited impatiently until the phone buzzed. He'll talk to you, his assistant said. Sharps lifted the phone. Sharps here. Another wait while the secretary got the senator. Charlie? Right, Sharps said. Art, I've got a proposition for you. Know about the comet? Comet? Oh, comet. Funny you mention that. I met the guy who discovered it. Turns out he was a heavy contributor, but I never met him before. Well, it's important, Sharps said. Opportunity of the century. That's what they said about Kutek. Goddamn Kutek. Look, Art, what's the chance we could get funding for a probe? How much? Well, take two cases. Second best is anything we can get. The lab can cobble up an unmanned black box, something that goes on a Thor Delta. No problem. I can get you that, Jellison said. But that's second best. What we need is a man to probe. Say, two men in an Apollo with some equipment instead of the third man. Art, that comet's going to be close. From up there, we could get good pictures. Not just the tail, not just the coma. There's a fair chance we could get pics of the head. Know what that means? Not really, but you just told me it's important. Jellison was silent for a moment. Sorry, I really am, but there's no chance. Not one chance. Anyway, we couldn't put up an Apollo if we had the budget. Yes, we can. I just checked with Rockwell. Higher risk mission than NASA likes, but we could do it. We've got the hardware. Doesn't matter. I can't get you a budget for that. Sharps frowned at the phone. The sick excitement rose in his stomach. Arthur Jellison was an old friend, and Charlie Sharps did not like blackmail, but... Not even if the Ruskies are putting up a Soyuz? What? But they're not. Oh... Yes, they are, Sharp said. And that's not a lie, not really, just an anticipation. You can prove that? In a few days. Rely on it. 
They're going up to look at Hamner Brown. I'll be dipped in shit. I beg your pardon, Senator? I will be dipped in shit. Oh. You're playing games with me, aren't you, Charlie? Jealous and demanded. Not really. Look, Art, it's important, and we need another manned mission anyway, just to keep up interest in space. You've been after a manned flight. Yeah, but I had no chance of getting one. There was more silence. Then Jellison said, more to himself than Sharps. So the Ruskies are going, and no doubt they'll make a big deal of it. I'm sure they will. Another silence. Charlie Sharps almost held his breath. Okay, Jellison said. I'll nose around the hill and see what kind of reactions I get, but you'd better be giving it to me straight. Senator, in a week, you'll have unmistakable evidence. All right, I'll give it a try. Anything else? Not just now. Okay, thanks for the tip, Charlie. The phone went dead. Abrupt he is, Sharps thought. He smiled thinly to himself, then punched the intercom button again. Larry, I want Dr. Sergei Fedeyev in Moscow, please. And yes, I know what time it is over there. Just get him on for me. The Legend of Gilgamesh was a handful of unconnected tales spreading through the Earth's fertile crescent in Asia, and the comet was nearly unchanged. It was still far outside the maelstrom. The orbit of the runaway moon called Pluto would have looked like a quarter held nearly on edge at arm's length. The sun, an uncomfortably bright pinpoint, still poured far less heat across the comet's crust than had the black giant at its worst. The crust was mostly water ice now. It reflected most of the heat back to the stars. Yet time passed. Mars swallowed its water in another turn of its long, vicious weather cycle. Men spread across the earth, laughing and scratching. And the comet continued to fall. A breath of the solar wind, high-velocity protons, flayed its crust. Much of the hydrogen and helium in its tissues had seeped away. The maelstrom came near. All right, well, I think that that's going to do it for this reading. We'll leave it off here and continue next time with Chapter 1, Subsection, March 1. Hope this has been interesting. Hope you're all enjoying, and I hope to see you in the next reading. Everybody, stay safe out there.